I welcome you to another live stream from our studios. With us here, two special guests. We have David Wood, and we also have the apostate prophet. Uh, he's still apostate so far, so we have no choice but to bring him and uh, figure out why he has not really repented from his apostasy. With that in mind, you know, David, what are we going to talk about today with Apostate Prophet and uh, the rest of the people who are joining us? Uh, I don't know. Maybe we should take questions or something. What do you think? Yeah, that's a great idea. We, Wait, you first, wanna... do, we have, do we have AP? Is he, can he hear us now? What's going on there? I think he can because he did smile when I said uh, uh, certain things. So, yeah, he can hear us. Can hear I, I want to... Oh, yeah. yeah. I hear the melodious yeah. sound of his voice. Can everyone else hear? <laughs> well, AP, how are you? Good. Thank, thank you. Uh, so you? good to have you. And thank you so much for your flexibility. I know we were going to meet an hour earlier, but uh, we uh, were kind of squeezed a little bit. And we wanted to talk about Muhammad and then more about Muhammad and then more, more videos about Muhammad. So, how, David, how, why don't you tell him about the things how, that we talked about? How about many Muhammad. How many videos did we just make about Muhammad and the satanic verses? Well, we made a lot, a and thousand? I hope by the time our friends will watch it, they will leave uh, following Muhammad, but uh, that's yet to be seen. So we talked about the satanic verses. We talked about the uh, worship of Muhammad. We talked about idolatry and forms of idolatry in Islam. And all of these things, of course, I'm sure AP is familiar with them. But let me ask you, AP, um, when you were a Muslim, uh, I mean, whether uh, devout or non-devout, I mean, who was Muhammad to you or at least... Muhammad to your community whenever you heard his name? Um, I mean, he was the holy, holy prophet, the most important uh, human being to ever walk the face of the earth. He was uh, everyone's uh, beloved uh, prophet, beloved man, beloved leader. We have to obey him fully, do whatever he says. Uh, and he was basically something like the assistant of God, you know, <laughs> it's like uh, we have to acknowledge him uh, together with Allah in order to be good, obedient Muslims. Yeah. And, 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 then, David, and then he wanted to do like so many drugs and to, uh, what did we talk about before? He want he wanted to run around fornicating in the streets and oh, yeah, do so yeah. many drugs and to urinate all over walls. He wanted those things so bad that he left Islam, even though he knows it's true. Uh, so he could do all these things. That's uh, that's the that's the story on the street, anyway. Yeah, well, I wanted to run people over and fornicate in the streets and uh, drink a lot of alcohol and do drugs <laughs> and buy homes with interest, which is why I eventually uh, ended up leaving Islam. That's what they say. Yeah, anyway, at least, at least he's honest, so that's the good part. <laughs> David, what about uh, uh, our uh, uh, late uh, brother Nabil? Now, when you were talking to him, I mean, mm -hmm. what, what did you perceive uh, in terms of his connection to Muhammad relationship? to Muhammad, for instance? Well, it was, uh, there, there are lots of Muslims like Nabil in, in the sense of uh, very, very respectful, good moral people. And they're not running around doing a lot of the, the uh, you know, the, the things that, that other young people might be doing and so on. And so they come across as, as, as really good people. And Nabil was a, was a really uh, was a really good guy. But at the end of the day, you find out that he's been given a completely warped picture of Muhammad. The information has been filtered for him by his community, by his family, by his parents to make Muhammad seem like a really, really wonderful, great guy. And then he's told to imitate this pattern of conduct. This is, this is Nabil's pattern of conduct. The problem is it's not the real Muhammad. It's it's a it's a it's a false Muhammad that has been made to sound really really good. And so, you're you know you're a young Muslim. You're following this Muhammad, and you end up imitating some some very wonderful um, characteristics. You end up with some 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 wonderful traits in your life, and then trouble arises when you start finding things out about Muhammad. And so various various things started to bother Nabil. The first thing he, I mean, he admitted, and this was, he didn't admit anything until after he converted about things that were actually bothering him. But the first thing that he said really started to bother him was Muhammad saying that you could, 
take your captives as sex slaves, rape them, you know, sell them in the next town and so on. Uh, it, it was uh, it's so interesting because he never gave me even a hint that that was bothering him. Later, he t- later after he, became, after he left Islam, became a Christian, he told me it was just tearing him up inside to and, read this about Muhammad. And I would agree. I mean, things that I was hearing, I never give the indication for pe- to people who are witnessing to me that it was bothersome to me. But later I confessed to them that it did. My wife, like I said, she heard about Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. She never indicated that it was bothersome to her, but it was actually mm-hmm. eating her up. You know, so, so what I'm saying is, uh, yeah, uh, Muslims are not going to really admit that, oops, you know, that's wrong, and, and I agree with you. No, they're not going to tell you that, you know. But it's good that, you know, if the topic is appropriate to discuss, why not? Mm-hmm. Go ahead and, and, and uh, discuss it. Go ahead, AP. I want to add something to that. I mean, uh, David basically explained it very, uh, very well. But um, so when I was growing up, when I was a little child, a little Muslim child, growing up in a very devout uh, Muslim family, I remember I had um, a series of books at my bedside that were uh, Turkish, distributed by a very, uh, by a religious uh, Muslim organization in Turkey. The series was titled My Beloved Prophet in Turkish. And uh, so the the first picture that I got from... uh, who this guy is that we are following and that we are so loyal to was that he is a uh, very beloved, a morally amazing guy. You know, uh, here is the thing. We talk a lot about uh, the moral problems uh, and the terrible, unthinkable things that Muhammad did. And um, many people might perceive it as if uh, Muslims are fully aware of uh, the terrible stuff that Muhammad did, but they are just uh, okay with that and they are just, you know, defenders of all that stuff. But the average Muslim population is not really raised that way. I was in a religious Muslim family and I was raised with the idea that Muhammad was uh, a very uh, lovely, loving man who was just uh, fighting for, uh, you know, the defense of his own people and he cared so much about us and he prayed so much for his ummah, for his Muslim community and all that. And... um, it is such a thing that Islam is uh, taught to the current uh, generation according to uh, what the current generation of Muslims can handle. So we were not casually informed about, um, you know, the, the the all the terrible things that Muhammad did and uh, how old Aisha was, for example, when he married her and how many wives he actually had and uh, the sex slavery and the mistreatment of people who were against him and who criticized him. I mean, we were told a few things such as that uh, concubines are allowed and, you know, slaves are taken from the oppressors and all that. But we were never really given the the true account of things. When you look at it from the outside, you realize, wait a minute, I was given an extremely distorted uh, picture of who Muhammad really was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, again, I want to welcome uh, everyone who's joining us uh, from both channels. It's uh, live streaming on David's channel, Acts 17 Apologetics, and also on my channel, Zero International. And uh, we want to also, I want to thank my moderators and uh, the the moderators on David's uh, channel. And uh, we would encourage you to ask questions. Now, here's why I'm going to be a little bit uh, careful when I say ask questions. If your question does not contain the words Muhammad or Islam or biblical things, you can count on me not ever talking about him. Because I've seen some questions right now that have nothing whatsoever to do with what we're saying. So if you feel like your question has been ignored, then your question was ignored. That's what I wanted to say. Hey, hey, you know, you know what's cool? We've got right here, we've got a former Muslim who's a Christian. We've got a former Muslim who's an atheist, and we got a former atheist who's a Christian. That's like that's a miracle. <laughs> that is a miracle, man. <laughs> this is the proof that this is the true that this is the true studio of God. <laughs> <laughs> so, AP, let me ask you this. Have you ever also wondered, growing up as a Muslim, about bowing down to the Kaaba, for instance, or the idea of the black stone? Have you ever thought, I I never thought about these things really as idolatry, but have you ever wondered about things like this? Um, The thing is, uh, you know, the mind is a little bit tricky. It's uh, when you think about uh, the past and how you thought in the past, you might perceive it as if you actually did about those, uh, did think about those things the way you think about them now. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, and I'm not sure if I thought about them uh, 
that far. If, if, and if I did really, um, you know, perceive those things slightly as idolatry. But I think what I am sure about is uh, when I was a Muslim and when we, when I did learn about, uh, you know, the, the, the Qibla and the Kaaba and how we pray and all that, um, it did occasionally cross my mind a little bit that this is, you know, that there is something strange to this. But I think I never pushed myself far enough to uh, to question that because uh, I was simply given the idea. I think I did I did even ask the question because I remember very well that we were given this, this certain explanation several times um, that, th that, that the Qibla, the praying toward the Kaaba, is supposed to be a sign of unity because, you know, Allah wants to unite us. He wants us to be one community that is uh, in sync with each other. And that was uh, the reason why we bow down towards uh, yeah. this this rock, but I never further questioned why this rock and what is the real backstory of that. All of that only came after I left Islam. Yeah, yeah, no, that uh, that's excellent. There is a question here, uh, David, um, mm -hmm. saying, "How can you?" Uh, well, uh, it used to be there; uh, it's gone now. Um, I, I did I did see a question that said, uh, "What are women according to Islam?" <laughs> <laughs> you may want to ask our yeah. nominee uh, yeah. to answer that question. What is a woman? What is women according to Islam? But you can actually give a, a reference from Surah Two. Your wives are a tilth. <laughs> your yeah. wives are a tilth. A, a tilth is a, yeah. Yeah. is a is ground you plow to sow your seed. <laughs> right? So yeah. uh, women women are a place to sow your seed according to Islam. Yeah, yeah you're supposed to enjoy them as you wish. Whatever. That's you right. Do. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how can you encourage a Muslim acquaintance to think more critically about Islam without offending or upsetting them? Uh, so that's to both of you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, see, I, see, I see very similar uh, questions. Uh, I've seen lots of similar questions that are along the same lines. What do, what do you think, AP? Um, I don't know. It's, it's very hard because, um, I mean, the indoctrination is such a big barrier in people's in people's minds. Even if you show them so much reason, it's very hard for it's very hard to make somebody actually think. Um, often they need to have some you know some some motivator to uh, to dare to you know question their deeply seated beliefs. But um, I mean, I would say you could start with uh, I don't know with with analyzing the Quran and asking why you would uh, trust. Muhammad, and if there is any, um, if even even within the Islamic texts, for example, there is never any mention of Muhammad, uh, of of the people surrounding him witnessing, you know, um, any of the revelations or the things that he does. The, the the one thing that they that people will bring up is that the moon was split in two, and then you could ask them. Uh, how can you believe that the moon was actually split in two when it is simply absurd that in the seventh century nobody in the world witnessed such a thing. I mean, you can approach this from very different angles. It really depends on who we are talking about. Yeah, and so. I would uh, I would add. Um, notice a AP talks about you know asking Muslims some questions, and just just keep in mind the difference because one of the goals as far as getting Muslims to think about uh, Islam and think critically about Muhammad is to get certain information into their heads that has not been provided to them, right? A, a, a lot of information that would cause them to doubt Muhammad has been kept from them. So you want to get that information across. But think about the difference here, right? If, if, uh, if uh, let's, let's suppose that, you know, you're a Muslim coworker of mine, or, you know, we, we both go to the same school or something like that, and we start having a, a conversation. Imagine me saying, um, Hey, did you know your prophet was a pedophile? He had sex with a nine-year-old girl. What sort of creepy pedophile is that? Notice there's not going to be a lot of critical thinking there, right? Like defensive walls are going to tend to go. I know I talk like that in my videos. That's that's not the same way I, I would talk if I were just in a conversation one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a Muslim. But given some time, I would want to get that information across. So compare that. Hey, your prophet's a pedophile where defensive walls are going up, going to go up. The person is not going to be thinking critically. The th person is going to be thinking about how to, uh, how to, uh, you know, blast away at, at you in return or how to get away from you as quickly as possible. Notice the difference between that and, on the other hand, me saying, uh, hey, you know, uh, I was watching a video by, you know, some wacko uh, who calls himself the apostate prophet on, on YouTube. And he said Terrible. that Muhammad, he said that Muhammad 
had sex with a nine-year-old girl, that this was one of Muhammad's wives, and he was criticizing it and so on. Um, but, you know, he's an atheist, so I, I was just, I would like to hear your perspective as a Muslim on this. So could you go ahead, and, I mean, it, it, would you be willing to look into that and then to give me your perspective on this issue so I have, you know, a Muslim perspective and the perspective of this uh, of this atheist? Notice you're not attacking there, you're asking someone for a Muslim perspective on the same issue. You are much, much, much more likely, I would say, uh, to get a Muslim to start thinking critically about Muhammad doing that because now it's gonna be thinking, okay, well, I, I have to defend my prophet to someone who's asking for information because I have to refute the apostate prophet and show the truth about my about Muhammad. So that's someone who, who might do a little bit of studying on how he could actually defend Muhammad, but in the process, he's going to learn more information. And, and then as the Muslim comes back and gives his response, you know, you'll be inclined to just, no, that's stupid. No, that, that, that's, that's not a good response. Uh, give, give a little bit of leeway. Um, you, can, you can raise some, some issues with what he has said. You can also just you know, thank him. Thank you, thank you for giving me your perspective on this. And you, would you mind if I had any, any further questions that I, that I could ask you? Could I come back and ask you more questions? And then come back, with, come back with something else or come back with another point about Aisha and so on. And over time, since now the person is uh, interacting with you and not just mad at you and doesn't ever want to talk to you again, you'll get a lot more information into the Muslim. And because he's actually trying to wrestle with the issue so that he can explain things to you, he ends up thinking a little critically in the in the process. Now, now hold on. Hold on a minute, David. Um, what if the person questioned uh, raises this amazing objection, uh, this very well-informed objection and says, but what about all the English kings who also married, uh, you know, little children? Or well, then you're children. then you're just refuted. That's it's game over. <laughs> <laughs> it's ball game. <laughs> I really like this setup, by the way. It looks like uh, here. I'm like, it looks like I'm watching over you too. So, yeah. oh, that's, yeah, that's uh, cool. yeah, that's great. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm so. judging you here. <laughs> So um, I th I th I saw a question. Um, I cannot remember now which one it is. To be honest, um, uh, I, yes, this is the one. Uh, saying, uh, is it easy to change moderate Muslims into radical? That's the first part. And can living in the West make Muslims to have better moral, which may be against radical ideology? Let me let me take a, a stab at this, and then uh, I'll have both of you address it. Uh, can you uh, change a moderate Muslim to a radical? Absolutely. Make him religious and have him read the Quran and the Sirah and what Muhammad taught, and you got yourself a devout Muslim who will become radical. I've been through it myself. I lived it. And I can tell you that you wouldn't think twice about the fact that you're radical. You would think you're fundamentalist in a, in a way that you are following the truth, following Islam. As far as can the West and living in the West change your morality as a Muslim, I am really not aware of that. I mean, in fact, Muslims and the Muslim communities will attack Muslims who become westernized and they'll they actually use that against you. But um, can Islam westernize its ideology? And the answer is yes. It can sound to you like a westernized ideology or westernized approach or Christianized approach, beginning to use arguments that as if it sound like westerners uh, uh, talking or Christians talking, but in fact, you try to water down any uh, behaviors or anything that may make Islam look awful. What do you say, uh, David and AP? Um, yeah, of, of, I mean, it's going to it's going to depend on the person. It's not like you could just radicalize uh, anyone. And I made a video about this a long time ago, called, a long time ago called the Jihad Triangle. And I point out that uh, you know, getting an actual jihadi isn't just one factor. It's it's a it's a combination of factors. So someone might not be radical for multiple reasons, right? He he, he could just not know that Islam teaches. Uh, he, he he might not have an accurate understanding of what Islam teaches, and so he he might have no intentions at all of subjugating the world or anything like that. Um, or he, he might have a personality that's just going to reinterpret anything because he doesn't want to believe that Islam. So you could put it you could put it right in front of his face, what his prophet said, and he still would just reinterpret it. So, um, yeah, there could be different kinds of reasons for why someone doesn't want to subjugate the world in the name of Allah. Uh, the problem is, you know, some of those reasons you can overcome when the time comes, right? In other words, uh, when, if, if, the, if the number 
of Muslims in a population reaches a certain critical mass, then if you're not if you're not joining them, if you're not part, of, they're coming after you too, right? They're, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna come after you, harass you, attack you as well. In other words, when a group like ISIS takes over, you'd be, you're going to have to get on board, even if you were moderate before, or they're, you're in trouble too. And so, uh, yeah, it's just a it's just a sad situation that's you're you're sort of in trouble either way. Yeah, AP. Um, I think you both said, said, said a lot here and uh, it's all appreciated. I just want to add a few um, things. I made a video about this before. There is actually a, um, a, a TV series, a Swedish one, which is called uh, Caliphate, and you can even find it on Netflix. Uh, why, why am I giving a Netflix suggestion? Well, um, the show is a Swedish show that is uh, very well informed, and it gives uh, people a perspective to understand why people, um, why regular people who are not even religious become, uh, you know, radicalized and join terrorist organizations, for example. And... Um, what they also uh, accurately depict there, and which is something that we don't often talk about, uh, which is a context that needs to be uh, addressed, uh, is that um, it is not just uh, you know the learning of religious religious texts and scriptures that makes people radical. It is also um, there are also many different factors, such as uh, you know Muslims, for example. Uh, live often as this one unit, one nation. And they learn that they are supposed to, you know, stand with each other, stay loyal to each other, uh, that the others are simply different, the others can't be trusted, they are friends of one another, and so on. And um, if certain Muslims are not very religious, they don't follow their religion properly, uh, in fact, if they are sinners, then uh, it can happen that these uh, sinning people who are aware that they are Muslims, that they have obligations, but they don't follow these obligations properly, uh, these people can be subjected to approaches from religious people to uh, do something for their religion. And they can be guilted into, uh, you know, in, in, into doing more for their religion and becoming a radical. This for them is an easy way out of their, uh, of, of their sinning, uh, lacking, apathetic uh, Muslim identity. So uh, this is for them an easy way to do something for their religion. And since Islam has this whole thing, since Islam has this whole system of uh, we are together against the others, it's very likely that people who feel like they are not good enough Muslims take such a way out and become radicalized. You know, that, that is that is very common. It, it happens very commonly among people who join Islamic terrorist organizations, for example. Can Muslims adopt better morals in the West? Uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, for example, said that uh, she actually thinks that uh, Muslims coming to the West does more harm to Islam than people think, because uh, those Muslims who come to the West are humans like all of us, and they see that life is better over here. They adopt different values, which uh, result in a gap between them and Islam. This changes Islam naturally and is actually good for the downfall of Islam. So um, I would definitely agree with her on that. Sure. Anything else you want to add, uh, David? So David, there's a question, even though it's on my channel, it's for you probably. When will you guys make a new series of Islamic videos, boom, boom, fake Islamic history? Is that on the horizon? Fake Islamic history? No, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. I still, we still have a lot of boom, boom room episodes to make. Yeah, and I think they're talking about the, the historical criticism that we've been doing lately, uh, like Jay Smith, uh, myself, um, other people. And, um, uh, you know, we have to be careful, uh, by the way. I mean, um, and, and, and Jay knows and uh, others know. It's always good to uncover and unearth these uh, research uh, data that has been hidden, uh, basically, either in books or articles. Not a whole lot of Muslim knew that there is questions about the Qibla, for instance, or questions about Mecca and when Mecca emerged and uh, the history of Islam and the question about the standard narrative and so on and so forth. But we also, I mean, it's always good to point these things out, meaning there is contradictions between what we know about Islam versus what the data support. I always like to uh, be uh, err on the side of caution. What if tomorrow we discover something that could actually prove to us you know, anything relevant to the standard Islamic narrative. So we have to leave the door also open for that. I'm not against, of course, exposing uh, the fact that there are some contradictions and uh, 
It is, uh, of course, on, on the Muslims to try to go and investigate things like, for instance, uh, how do we know that Muhammad was born in 570? Uh, how do we know that uh, Islam started in 610 AD? How do we know that he died in 632? How do we know that the Qibla initially was toward Jerusalem and then later was towards Mecca? And uh, the list can go on and on and on. I mean, we rely on Islamic sources that were written at a later time. There is a lack of eyewitness accounts. But this is just the direction I like to take myself. AP, uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, no, nothing further to add. Okay. <laughs> Endorsed? Yeah, endorsed. David, are you endorsing it too? No. no. <laughs> of course, David would. He cannot endorse anything. <laughs> endorse my own stuff, that's it. <laughs> no, you, uh, really, uh, seriously, you did a debate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's a friendly debate with Jay mm -hmm. uh, about the existence of Muhammad. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us why, uh, for instance, I mean, just reiterate to people why you take the position that, no, Muhammad did exist. At the end of the day, I really, I, I, I just really believe it's too much. It's too much stuff, right? Um, the story, the idea that he, Muhammad was invented later, right? So if you want to say that he's invented some later time, during the time of some ruler, and they invent this story about Muhammad, the number of problems that they invent and not just the number of problems they invent, but the number of, of sources of, about these problems they, they invent. So notice, um, if, and this is an example I give, but if you're saying that the story of Muhammad is just invented at this point, well, guess what? There, there never was any satanic verses. They there never happened, right? When you line up the stories about the satanic verses, you clearly see from the earliest until the latest that they water it down and water it down and water it down and water it down and water it down. So at first, Muhammad is, Satan actually puts it in Muhammad's mouth. Muhammad speaks it. Later, later sources, it's just Satan speaks it and imitates Muhammad's voice to make it sound. Still later, suddenly the story is taken out and the, the pagans are bowing down in honor of the revelation, but they don't even say what the revelation is, right? It slowly gets watered down. But guess what? None of that ever happened. Nothing, nothing there. So you're saying that someone invents the story about Muhammad delivering and invents the story about it being watered down and invents another story about it being watered down and invents it. Why are you inventing any of that? If, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're coming up with an entire history of how this thing got watered down, then it must be embarrassing at the time you're, you're inventing the story. Well, why in the name of common sense are you inventing the story? Why are you inventing 50 different sources on this story that you're made up? And notice, that, that's just the example of the satanic verses. You go through um, the various hadith collections and so on, there's so many stories just piled upon uh, you know, just massively mounted up. And then you look, and it's not just Muhammad, it's the supporting cast, it's the wives, it's the next generation. And so they've got the, you know, you got Abu Bakr, and he has kids, and then they have kids, and they, they keep records of all these people and what they did and so on. If, if, if that is all just invented, this is the most amazing conspiracy, this is the mother of all conspiracy theories. There's never been a conspiracy theory that involves more conspiracy than this, like none. Like, like if you take the biggest conspiracy theory in the history of humanity, you'd have to multiply it times a hundred million to get what you're required for Islam to just be invented in, in you know, some later time and then writing all this back. With that said, there are problems with the, the standard narrative. There, I, I grant there are all kinds of problems with the standard narrative. Um, but I just can't bring myself, I just can't bring myself to say he's made up, he's a, he's, a, he's a fabrication. Yeah, the position that I always like to take is that there was somebody and uh, something happened and uh, there is uh, embellishment and re-embellishment and improvement to the story. And, uh, you know, maybe there are a couple of factions that held on to certain parts, others distance himself uh, from him, and you begin to see variations of that story, maybe. But you're right, at a later time, you begin to see these improvements taking place. For instance, if you look at the uh, tafsir, uh, the commentaries, you'll see that the earlier commentators relied more heavily on opinions, and you get to the 7th, 8th century of Islam, and you begin to see they reinforce opinions now by alleged hadith, alleged sayings of Muhammad. In other words, they kind of like figured out the weaknesses, and they began to plug those holes, if you wish, holes in that narrative. AP? Oh, uh, uh, let me yeah, just add one more thing. I just wanted to add, say, 
even I want to point this out um, because I know two guys, both Jake Smith and Robert Robert Spencer, um, who deal with this issue. I just wanted to clarify, even though I believe Muhammad existed, and I, I can't imagine a scenario where I would not not believe that anymore, uh, just because of the, the the sheer volume of the information and just how 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 much it would boggle my mind to think that they just made up all of this stuff. Um, even though, even though I believe in Muhammad, it's still a good idea to push the idea and to press Muslims on, how do you even know that Muhammad existed? Look at all these problems with your narrative, even about Muhammad's existence. And so, um, you, you know, you have to push that because you want Muslims to be able to defend their own position and they need to defend their own prophet mm -hmm. and they need to they need to they need to be the ones answering some of these problems. Like if Muhammad's going around Arabia doing all this stuff, why don't you have more? Why ha why has no one ever heard of him? Why isn't Mecca on these ancient maps and so on? So they do have to answer that. So you do have to press you do have to press the issue. So I just wanted to be clear on that. That even though I believe Muhammad existed, go ahead and press it now. AP. Yeah. AP. I, I think David makes uh, some great points. I want to add to that a few things. Um, if you ask me, I would say uh, I'm not an expert in the field. I don't concern myself too much with the historicity of Muhammad. But uh, I mean, when you think about it, it is almost, um, I would think, I would say it is almost impossible that Muhammad did not exist. And we have uh, no reason little to no reason to assume that he didn't exist or to conclude that he didn't exist. There's simply uh, too much going on. Uh, the Muslims were not even united uh, enough at the very beginning to, uh, you know, to to really uh, pull through with this, with, with such a conspiracy of inventing a figure uh, who... I mean, the, the earliest sources that we have about Muhammad, the external sources, non-Muslim sources, come from uh, 630, from the 630s AD, uh, which is just after uh, after Muhammad's death, and only at that time the Muslims were already too divided uh, internally. They became more divided within those same generations that that must have witnessed Muhammad uh, over those decades. It is simply inconceivable to me that despite all those divisions, these people would somehow, uh, you know, cling to a made-up figure or, you know, a made-up uh, a uh, myth of a figure called Muhammad and actually, you know, go through with that without ever questioning it. We have too many sources uh, that lead back to Muhammad. We have uh, remnants of certain uh, writings, certain documents that are said to have been written in the time of Muhammad. Certain companions left these, um, what's it called? Uh, it's called uh, Sahifa, which are... Um, the very primitive forms of hadith collections uh, that are supposed to lead back to Muhammad's time, where people who were directly with Muhammad made some very uh, primitive attempts at recording the things that he said. Um, I don't know, it's just, I mean, we have a lot of historical figures that we um, say uh, you know, they existed, and we have much less evidence for their existence than we have for Muhammad. So by historical standards, looking also at the historical consensus on the historicity of Muhammad, I don't think we have any reason to conclude that Muhammad didn't exist. That said, I also don't really concern myself with that issue very much. I focused more on um, on whether Muhammad existed or not, we have a Muhammad, a historical, a, a, a central figure within the Islamic religion. And that central figure, based on the claims of Islam itself, did and said a few things, and those things are problematic, and we need to address those. The historicity is uh, very much a secondary issue, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Um, there is a question here from Happy Camper. Thank you for your super chat, by the way. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, do you think scholars will attempt to change Islam over the next decade to mitigate damages, uh, apostasy, so on and so forth? As uh, for an example, uh, the, uh, the questioner is saying the suggestion to remove some hadith, like for instance, uh, the government of Turkey made that suggestion, the idea that the um, the Crown Prince of Saudi also uh, alluded to something like that. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, and I'll let you guys answer also. Um, yeah, they, they may attempt. Sure, I mean I'm sure some scholars will attempt to try to either um, uh, um, clarify things, uh, try to uh, uh, fix things, uh, uh, you know, uh, plug some of the holes, maybe even water down uh, some of these things in the Hadith or in the uh, uh, Sira, whatever the case might be. But we're living in a, a digital age where it will be impossible for anyone to hide 
basically hide everything because someone has a copy of it. Someone have kept it somewhere and someone gonna come back later in the future and show that what, what you're saying uh, contradicts what I have. For instance, you know, uh, uh, you look at uh, examples, um, you know, just in history alone when it comes to the history of the Quran itself. While we are told that the Quran is perfectly preserved, we have evidence today uh, that there are uh, Quranic manuscripts that have corrections in them. The idea that Uthman burned all competing copies, well, we know that that's not true, even from Islamic own sources, because we have someone by the name of Ibn Mujahid, 300 years later, after the time Uthman, still had to deal with variant text reading. So what I'm saying is, it will be impossible to just change history just because you decided that you want to do that. Are they going to attempt to do some cleanup work? Sure. Clean up at aisle seven, I'm sure they're going to do something like that. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I, I want to I'll, give I'll, a very I'll, quick response to this. Yeah, I'm just going to give a quick response too. And no, it's no, David, you need, you need to wait. Uh, first, I respond. Uh, yeah, AP first. Uh, uh, let please. the atheists yeah. last, all right? <laughs> Christians first, atheists last, all right? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I would just add very quickly that uh, I think you'll have both reactions, right? Because Muslims are seeing apostates leave, people leaving Islam, and you can have two basic reactions. One, we need to fix Islam so that people aren't as bothered by it and they don't leave. And the, but the other reaction is we're, we're not being devout enough and we're compromising and that's why people are leaving Islam. Because you do have like Daniel, Daniel Hakikachu and people like that and his followers who are, no, we need to, we need to just we need to state exactly what Islam teaches and not be ashamed of it, and that's the way forward. So I think you're going to have you're going to have both reactions. Yeah, AP, you get the rest of the day uh, to uh, take over. Uh, yeah, go ahead and bear. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I see David lost some weight. He's really uh, trying, I guess. I don't know. Oh, uh, aside yeah. from he that, he hasn't uh, been eating anything. Trust me on that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I understand. Well, um, see now he distra Now he. Uh, I'm now, now I lost track of my thoughts. It's about whether whether scholars are gonna gonna uh, tweak. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I, uh, what I wanted to say uh, in response to the question is, uh, what do you mean by attempt? I mean, Muslim scholars have been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. They have been uh, trying to change Islam and trying to rewrite the sources of Islam uh, from the very beginning. The problem with with that is, um, I said this before, you can't change Islam. It's just a very futile attempt. Um, the Quran is there. You either have that Quran as an authentic source or you don't. If you prove at some point the Quran had additions or, or modifications and Muslims uh, come to accept that uh, as a fact, then Islam is done with. It's over. There is no, you, you can't possibly get out of that. You can't change that because that is the fundamental claim that Islam relies upon, that the Quran is the perfect word of Allah that was delivered and perfectly preserved verbatim as it is. If you discover and uh, agree that there were changes made, then Islam is done, it's over. Uh, when it comes to the Hadith, there are already attempts, there have been attempts forever to say, well, this Hadith is actually not entirely correct, this one is not true, Muhammad also said this and that. There is already a huge disagreement on that within the Islamic community today, as has been the case uh, forever. But um, we have a, a concept called mutawatir hadith in Islam. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I said this would be a short response, but apparently it's not. That was a lie. <laughs> no, I told you to take uh, forever. You know. <laughs> we have a concept called mutawatir hadith, which are uh, by Islamic standards, hadith that are uh, agreed upon to be authentic because it is inconceivable that um, so many people came together and invented th this hadith. That is a definition by Islamic standards. And those hadith already co uh, contain too many problematic things, be it uh, historicity, uh, theology, uh, the scripture, the, the morals, and all that. So attempts will be made, but it will never be successful. It will only end up uh, breaking Islam apart. Agreed. Agreed. Hey, you, 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 uh, know, yeah, you know, it's funny. People are saying uh, when you said David's not eating, they all said, "Hey, David's fasting for Ramadan." I just wanted, <laughs> I just wanted to be, just wanted to be clear, guys. If I were, if I were fasting for Ramadan. I would be gaining massive amounts of weight. That's true. That's what happens in Ramadan. Yeah. You 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 gorge yourself at night, and you gorge yourself. You gorge yourself uh, right before dawn, and then you gain weight throughout the month of Ramadan yeah. for your fasting. <laughs> Yep, that's that's why I say, that's why I just say change the name to the feast of Ramadan, and I you know I, I have no problem. I have yeah. no problem. Look at me, I, I gained a lot of weight. That's because of my Ramadan. Yeah, it's fast. Yeah, AP's feasting for yeah. Ramadan. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, starting yeah. early. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Well, uh, Ra, thank you so much for your uh, super chat. By the way, Ra, we agree with you that uh, chapter 17 of the Quran has a problem when Muhammad claimed that there is a masjid, you know, yeah. known as the That's Masjid Al-Aqsa. We, we know that. I mean, it's just... Um, and, so, and so just to be clear, when, 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 earlier when I'm saying that I believe Muhammad existed, I also I also believe there's a, a, a lot of fabrication. There, there's, mm -hmm. there's, lots of, there's lots of fabrication, fabrication and tweaking sources and so on. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that is a problem. Yeah. Uh, so well, I would say Muhammad had no idea what the what the masjid in Jerusalem actually uh, was in reference to. He didn't understand it a bit. He probably got some traditions off it during his right. travels and from the Jews, but he had no clue what was actually going on. He just I, I, wanted I, to combine it with his religion and failed. I've, I've I've even read suggestions that he wasn't even talking about that mosque. He was talking about a, a much closer mosque, and that the farthest mosque was was still something that was that was uh, comparatively very close to them. And later Muslims actually. Uh, embellished it to make it sound like it was talking about Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean all, we, we all have it in the Quran, so, yeah. sorry. We, we have it in the Quran and backed up with the, with the early, um, you know, biographies that uh, the Jews were mocking him and mocking the Muslims because they were saying, hey, you're just imitating us. You know, you're just worshiping toward uh, our, uh, you know, destination of, uh, of worship. Uh, so Muhammad got angry and then changed the direction from Jerusalem toward Mecca. I mean, this is the, this is the Islamic narrative. This is the Islamic tradition itself. And the Quran then responds and says, uh, says, you know, uh, don't be sad. I will change uh, it toward the direction that you desire, which is, uh, which, which is Mecca. And then Muhammad rejoices and uh, the excuse that is given by Allah the Almighty Creator the Eternal One is um, the early uh, Qibla toward Jerusalem like the Jews was just to test the Muslims but now this is the correct one now pray toward uh, Kaaba which is just very absurd I mean seriously Muslims look at this and laugh about it a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah well, um, we, we had a comment, uh, I mean, even though um, I'm not really so sure w w why our friend here is asking that question, um, uh, you know, like the question is like, um, why do Muslims not know that uh, their arguments have been dealt with a thousand years ago in the church councils? Well, I think you're making a lot of assumptions here that Muslims even go and investigate these councils, for instance. Uh, but, but I want to ask this question now to both of you. Today's Muslims mm -hmm. who have access to the internet, today's Muslim who can access libraries, today's Muslims who can watch these videos and go and investigate the sources, why do they still insist anyway that their history is perfect, that there is nothing wrong with the Quran and so on and so forth? I can understand the older, uh, the, the other generations, you know, of Muslims. But what about these? Well, it, it 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 takes a while. I mean, these things take a while because it's not like all these Muslims are are, are investigating these issues. They're, you know, in general, they're still getting their information about Muhammad from their leaders and their families and so on, and they're going to school and they've got a, they've got other things to do. But yes, as far as you know, Muslims, you know, not getting this 500 years ago or 800 years ago or a thousand years ago, the Muslim community for a really long time was pretty well insulated, right? They're not interacting mm -hmm. with this stuff. All their information about Muhammad and the Quran is coming from their Muslim leaders. You can't go and criticize what they're being taught or you'll get your head chopped off. And so the Muslim community for a very long time was very well insulated from hearing um, criticisms of the Islamic position. So now we've just, I mean, in our lifetimes, transitioned into an era where now all the, the sources are wide open for people to uh, criticize. And we have open access to anyone with an internet connection. But notice, I mean, this has been a this has been a very short period of time when all of this has happened. And you know, AP's been on YouTube for a couple of years. Me, I'm considered I'm considered like a grandpa on YouTube, and Dinosaur. I've been at yeah, I've been at it for for 12 years. So this stuff is I mean, this stuff is brand new. And you're already looking at you know, you're already looking as of a couple of years ago, 24% of of young Muslims were were leaving Islam. So it's it's uh, it's just getting started. But yeah, yeah. Uh, AP, you want to add something to that? Yeah, yeah. David made a good point. He's a, he's a dinosaur in this whole <laughs> stuff. He experienced it from the from the very beginning. But um, the issue is, uh, you know, I experienced it myself. I had a lot of questions when I was a Muslim, and I was uh, during that period when I uh, began to question my uh, my beliefs. I was extremely religious, and I was really in love with my religious beliefs. I thought this is the absolute truth. I should never, ever go away from this. And I prayed to Allah to keep me in that spot. Um, the thing is, and humans have, uh, you know, the cognitive biases, uh, 
like the cognitive dissonance, which is very much at play here. You have the very harsh indoctrination uh, of Islam, and you are faced with uh, questions that contradict your Islamic beliefs. And then you are between uh, two conflicting things. You have your fundamental firm Islamic beliefs, and you have the doubts that challenge those beliefs. Uh, and you are now between them and you have to make a choice that 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 state gives you great discomfort i felt that same thing now uh, the average muslim would say even i myself would say back then that i was too weak i gave in i didn't have enough faith i wasn't good enough and i uh went for the doubts and you know started breaking down my religion uh others are have different motivations to hold on to their be beliefs for example they want uh, loyalty they want community they want safety and so on so they let go of those doubts, just shut them down, find some explanations for them and hold on to their Islamic beliefs instead and continue going on with, with them. Despite the fact that you lay it down very plainly that, for example, the whole uh, Jesus narrative in Islam is entirely nonsensical, that the Kaaba doesn't make sense, that the sun doesn't go to a place and prostrate to Allah's throne at night and so on. Yeah. Uh, hey, hey, hold on. Hold on. Did, did you notice this comment here? Who made your green screen new set? Who yeah, made know, your green screen? Guys, can, it, it, can, can, can we get a wide shot? Is it possible exactly. to get a wide shot? In fact, shot? I want to stand Hold and on. walk. I'll, I'll, I'll go stand and them. walk over here. Yeah, huh? Yeah. We, we, we get a wide shot? Hold on. Wait, yeah, this yeah. is a green screen. There is nothing <laughs> fake here <laughs> except this screen we're AP on. That's oh, the only fake thing we have. This is the green screen back here, right, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, I'm there you go. Good. This is the best green screen ever. <laughs> I mean, this is the most amazing green I'm screen right I've here. ever seen. Can you guys see? I, I am the only fake here. Yeah. This is right here. Right here. This is the screen. Can you guys see me? Look, right it's here. green. Hey, I thought green screen doesn't work very well if you're right up against this. <laughs> it's so weird. It must be magic green screen. There is no fake stuff behind me. Yeah. Respect we the do res not do <laughs> fake news. Respect the game, people. This is old school, real studio. This is hilarious. <laughs> No, I, I am the only thing that is fake here. Though. Everything else looks real. <laughs> it's funny. We flipped out because they said green screen. <laughs> so offended. <laughs> so um, I thought I saw someone was saying, uh, well, well, Kevin Zander, what is your question in the first place? Uh, so I can tell you if it is appropriate or not. I mean, I don't see a question here. We uh, probably You probably questioned e earlier, but they were coming too fast. Yeah. Um, did you guys catch any? Uh, did you catch any question uh, on your channel? Uh, there's tons of questions on my channel. I only see questions about David's weight. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, I mean, if you just want me to randomly pick questions, uh, someone says, uh, "Question: Whenever my Muslim friends hear about terrorist groups, they say, oh, they're not Muslims.' <laughs> what are your thoughts on that?" Well. <laughs> Well, uh, it's a miracle of yeah. reinterpretation. <laughs> Muhammad said, I've been made victorious with terror. So, I mean, maybe Muhammad's not uh, not a Muslim either. But, I mean, it's been, terrorism has been a, a core tactic of Islam to achieve the goals of the religion for 14 centuries. So, if, it's, if it makes you not a Muslim, then you got prob 14 centuries worth of problems. I, let, let me tell you uh, something. I learned uh, as a Muslim, and I can, um, you know, reaffirm this in in basically every uh, book of Islamic uh, creed, that a Muslim may never claim that another self-professed Muslim is not a Muslim or is a non-Muslim, unless that self-professed Muslim uh, explicitly says, I am not a Muslim anymore, or I don't believe in Allah anymore, or um, openly and willingly and knowingly uh, contradicts with a very clear, uh, you know, Islamic doctrine. For example, uh, the, the, for example, the Muslim is told, um, you have to uh, pray five times a day, and then the Muslim says, "Yeah, I know, I know it says that, but I don't think so." Then that person uh, can officially be declared a non-Muslim. Otherwise, uh, you are not allowed within the Islamic uh, creed uh, and the Islamic religion to say this guy is a non-Muslim, this guy is a non-Muslim, this guy is a non-Muslim because he kills innocent people. This is simply not something that you can do. This is an invention in our time. So, yeah. it's, it's not in, it's not compatible with the Islamic uh, theology itself to do that. Yeah. I'm going to address uh, uh, Kevin's uh, question, and then 
Uh, we can go back again, David. I think uh, there is a question I, I think I noticed on your channel as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Kevin, you're saying, why hasn't God allowed someone like Elijah to come on the scene and expose Allah just as Elijah, uh, Elijah exposed Baal? Well, it doesn't work that way, uh, Kevin. I mean, if God wants to do this, well, uh, every day he's going to send us somebody because there is every day there is something fake. But I can tell you an answer since you're using the Bible uh, and Elijah in Old Testament. Uh, we just did this in a, in a series that we were recording earlier, and I talked about Deuteronomy 13. Look what Deuteronomy 13 says, starting from verse 1. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Notice what the reason is. For the Lord your God is testing you. Okay? So we know that God is testing us. Based on what? Based on the truth that he has revealed to us already. Jesus says, False prophets and false messiahs will arise and deceive, even if possible, the elect. Notice what Jesus is saying? So, we have the truth already. I don't need God to send me another prophet uh, to be able to figure that out. He already sent me Jesus and it's done. That's it. And we have the Bible, we have the Word of God, and that's what I would use to test, basically, what is false and what is not false. David. We're good. No? You refrain from that? AP, uh, would you like to use the Bible all the time, AP? So uh, go ahead and give us an answer. I agree. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so there is a question on your channel. Here. What's that? Did Muhammad think... Did uh, Muhammad think Dual Karnain was a Muslim? Yes. <laughs> yeah, he did. Of course. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a rightly guided guy who was uh, doing a lot of amazing things uh, given to him with the power of Allah. And it just happens to be so that Dhulkarnain also is oddly similar to Alexander the Great and legends about him, but that's just a coincidence. Yeah, so, so that, that's the real issue, right? I mean, the Quran indisputably portrays him as a Muslim and all of the events that are that are described in the narrative about Dual Karnain just happen to parallel all these things about Alexander the Great. But we know Alexander the Great was as pagan as you could possibly be. So Muslims say it's not talking about Alexander the Great, it's someone else. And all the events just happen to line up with Alexander the Great and not not actually line up with things Alexander the Great actually did. They they line up with what are called the Alexander romances, these uh, fictional stories about Alexander. And so it's just coincidence. And then we ask, OK, well, if it's not Alexander, who is it? And show us how this person did all these things, you know, like finding the, the place where the sun set. Which, by the way, Alexander did <laughs> in the Alexander romances. That's another that's another parallel. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Who who else found this, the place where the sun sets? Right. It was Alexander, and uh, uh, but if it's not Alexander, then who else? That is true, man. Well, I don't see any questions so far related uh, to what we're talking about. Um, AP, tell us um, uh, anything new you're working on? Um, any videos um, people should expect? Definitely, definitely. I just wanted to address a very uh, quick question here that I missed. Some somebody asked. Uh, Al-Fadi and AP, have either of you investigated why Imam Abu Hanifa was imprisoned by the Abbasid Caliph for 14 years? He died in prison. He was a scholar from Umayyad era. So how does uh, this relate? Um, well, okay, I, I don't know if, if we actually want to go into this. This is very um, off topic and lengthy. But yeah, he, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa was uh, one of the greatest Islamic scholars, the first, uh, uh, the founder of the first school sure, yeah. of Islamic jurisprudence, the Hanafi school. Yeah. And uh, many of these scholars who are who, who later became uh, extremely respected, like praised so much and held in such high regard were in their own times uh, not, <laughs> uh, not very much in agreement with their Islamic rulers and their, and their caliphs who were pursuing different understandings of Islam. So they got in a lot of trouble. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa and um, uh, Ahmad bin Hanbal, for example, he was also another one who was uh, big, very great 
greatly in trouble with with the law because uh, the Muslims were not united. They had no uh, unanimous agreement on what Islam actually is. They were extremely divided on how Islamic law should work and what Muslims should, uh, you know, definitely believe and not believe in what they should accept and reject. So Muslims fought each other and resisted against each other and engaged in extremely heated debates, which ended in things like imprisonment and death. Um, but yeah, that's, that's just a backstory of Islam that many people are not aware of nowadays. That's right. But if, if anyone wants to add anything to that. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I think you're, you're, you did uh, good. If you want to add even more, uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, uh, I'm, I'm fine. Quick ones. Uh, Mert says, uh, maybe it's out of context, but what kind of doctor Brother Wood is? Uh, we don't know. That's oh. the question. <laughs> Does anyone know what that kind of doctor uh, Brother Wood is? A medical doctor. <laughs> Isn't he a medical doctor? A medical DSM doctor. doctor. <laughs> DSM-5 doctor. Can, can you say, I'm a medical doctor? Uh, yeah. I'm a medical doctor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in reality, it's, phil it's philosophy. So nothing to do with medicine. Philosophy. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, let's yeah. see. Looks like there are other so, so nothing, basically. Yeah. Um, hell slide question. Muslims try to draw a parallel between moon splitting and sun standing still by Joshua to say, if you have no problem believing that, then why are you mocking the moon splitting? Why are you mocking the moon splitting, David? Um, I have no, I have no problem with God splitting the moon or doing, uh, doing anything miraculous. Um, the idea is, and, and you, you, you can, to be clear, you can have Christians that interpret uh, that interpret, you know, Old Testament miracles in various ways. As you know, is the is the is the universe coming to a stop, or uh, is God performing some miracle to keep the 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 sky lit up for the purpose of the the Jews as they're as they're fighting or something like this? Um, but if we're just sticking with this, you know, if we're just going with the straightforward text, um, the claim is not with. with when it comes to Muhammad, the claim is not that God can't perform a miracle or that it's absurd that God could perform this miracle. AP's objection is that there were tons of people around at this time, mm -hmm. and there are tons of people writing around this time across, you know, across the, the known world at the time. So why isn't anyone else talking about this? Why is no one else talking about the moon being split? There would have been plenty of people to see it. And the Muslim response is, well, they were all sleeping. And so the question is, yeah, the question is how, you know, how seriously you take that. Assuming we go with the straightforward narrative um, about Joshua, um, why don't we have more sources on it? Well, what sources are you dealing with 14 centuries BC? That would, that would be the question. So, yeah. So you're in a, you're, wanna, you're, you're, in, you're in a very different, you're in a, you're, you're, you've got 2,000 years of a gap between those between those events. Uh, but with that with that said, you can raise the same objection. Why why haven't we heard more of that or something? You can raise that. You can raise the same objection. But go ahead, AP. Yeah. So I want to give my non-religious approach to that uh, and just say it's 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 not really the two things are not are not equivalent. Uh, as David said, uh, I too don't have a problem with the claim that God could split the moon in two or Allah could split the moon in two. That's, that's, a, that's a claim of uh, something supernatural happening. I'm not going to uh, try and dispute that just the way that I'm not going to try and dispute uh, the idea of the, of, of, of the, you know, of the sea being uh, opened and split in two or of this, of, of trees and the sun prostrating at night and all that. These are supernatural claims of supernatural things that I'm not here to, to dispute or anything about the idea with the moon splitting in two is that it, it supposedly happened in the seventh century that the moon uh in at night was split in two and stood there and people could clearly observe this if uh it's true that this happened then we would definitely find uh, external sources about that from around the world we had a lot of uh, mythologies in the seventh century that held the moon in very high regard people had moon gods anything regarding the moon would be extremely important for them we had advanced uh 
you know, people who would observe the moon and the, the sky day and night. We had people who were standing guard in, 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 in Western uh, kingdoms and realms. This is not something that would just go unnoticed. People wouldn't be like, ah, oh, you know, who cares? It's just the moon. Uh, in comparison to that, what you're talking about in the Bible is something we don't even know exactly when that would happen. But the estimate is, is I guess, uh, 1,300, 400, 500 uh, BC. It's a time that is incomparable. And I would say... Uh, uh, what is exactly happening there is vaguely described and not similar to uh, to what the, the Islamic claim is. I'll just draw another another comparison. Another another thing is uh, the intent of sort of bringing forward the miracle. So in Islam, you say, why are you talking about the splitting of the moon? This is supposed to be something that's confirming that Muhammad's a prophet for us, right? Like, because according to the Quran, it really looks like Muhammad didn't perform any miracles except for bringing the Quran. And then we point out, wait a minute, according to the Quran, Muhammad couldn't perform miracles except bringing the Quran. The response is, ah, but he split the moon. And then the question, what exactly do you mean by he, he split the moon? Because if a Muslim said, you know, Muhammad performed you know, something and there were, it appeared to them that way for some supernatural sign to the people who are watching right there. That would be one thing. But Muslims are actually claiming that, that, that the moon was split in two and that it was this miracle. But this is the miracle that's supposed to refute the claim that Muhammad couldn't perform miracles. And so it's actually being put forward as something where we're supposed to test what the evidence is for it. And the evidence is really, really, really shaky because it's not even clear that the Quran is claiming that Muhammad did anything with the moon. There are even interpretations. You can read one in, in, the, uh, in the commentary of the Yusuf Ali translation of the Quran, where he, he puts commentary saying one of the interpretations of this is it's talking about a sign of the end times. It's not even talking about something Muhammad did because it doesn't say Muhammad went out and split the moon. It's just, it, just, it, it just says the moon, is, the moon is split in two. It's later Muslim sources from much later that say, oh, Muhammad split the moon. And so you're talking about Muhammad splitting the moon, you're, and it doesn't look like that's what the Quran is saying. And it's much later, and it's written at a time when Muslims are constantly being challenged by Christians and Jews. Hey, if you're saying Muhammad's a prophet, tell us what miracles he did. And all of a sudden they start getting these miracles when their earliest source, the Quran, says he didn't perform any that looks like something we need to be very, very, very critical uh, about. Whereas, you know, if you're talking about Christianity, the resurrection is the miracle that's put forward as here's something you should be investigating. If you want to know, you should, uh, you should believe in Jesus. And so, yeah, different, yeah. sort of different stories entirely. Yeah. True. I see yeah. a lot of questions, but I want to just address one topic because we're getting uh, ready to wrap up to head to the airport, by the way, folks. So I just want to ask both of you about the, the sheikh and the claim that he was stabbed, uh, basically. I mean, I, I saw something yesterday. I just want to make, be careful. Was he stabbed? And do we know anything about this stabbing? Uh, we will be going live to discuss that tomorrow because as soon as as soon as I landed here, I start getting, "Ha ha, David, you have not responded. You have not, you have not condemned this." I was like, "What the heck are you talking about? I know nothing about it." <laughs> it's always interesting when people condemn you for not condemning something that you had no clue happened, right? It's like, why haven't you condemned this? No idea. I had no idea that it happened. But anyway, we've been here recording nonstop, and so I haven't looked into it. I've seen. Uh, I think he was definitely stabbed just based on, you know, just based on the, the, the comments and so on. But I've also seen things saying that it was a road rage incident. Like uh, he got into an argument with someone while driving or something like that. And then I think he, I, I saw, again, this is why I would not want to even talk about it because I haven't looked into it. But supposedly he punched a guy and the guy stabbed him. And then somehow, I guess we're getting <laughs> David Wood and the apostate proffer to getting blamed. <laughs> for the road rage, in, road rage incident, if it was a road rage incident. That's why we need to look into it, because it's also possible that, based on what I know, that mm -hmm. the guy said, and, and here's what I'm doing to you in the name of the apostate prophet. Uh, but I have no idea, and that's why I, that's why I have well, not I, comment, that's why I have not commented on it. Right. I right. have seen that uh, there, there is a video of the guy actually saying pretty messed up things to him uh, about him being a Muslim. And oh, about okay, his, okay. Uh, well, that is and about his and about his videos. So, uh, in so far, that's 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 relative. Uh, okay, so that's not that's not normal. That's not normal. That's the case. Then, then definitely, uh, yeah, we, yeah. We certainly, I, I can. But it could also be true that David that David is uh, responsible for the stabbing. That could also be true. But we will discuss that uh, tomorrow. We are, actually have a live stream set up uh, where we will be reacting 
reacting to that David Wood and I tomorrow. So uh, we can extensively talk about that once we mm -hmm, mm -hmm. learn yeah. more. And so get the it. idea is we will look into it before tomorrow, and then after we've looked into it, then we will we will comment and we will we will condemn where condemnation is due. And That's if right. someone is if someone is stabbing our friend, well, whatever you're whatever you're stabbing, you know, Uthman uh, Ibn Farouk for. Um, then we would condemn you for using violence. But I mean, especially if you're just doing it, not, you know, not some nut, nut job in a, in a road rage incident, but actually, hey, I'm targeting him because, you know, because of his videos or something like that. Guess what? None of us want people getting stabbed over videos here. That is true. And, and no, I mean, it's, uh, it's absolutely wrong. Even if we disagree with his views, that doesn't give anyone the right to go and just stab somebody just because you don't like what no, they're saying. It's the United States of America, man. And that's why he's here. Mm -hmm. And that's why he has the right to express his, his views and everything. So uh, have a comment. Thank you, Ragin. Uh, you're saying is in Islam a polytheistic, basically, um, as uh, they must pray to the black stone and run between two hells. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything. We, we did talk about this today also. We did a video, I think, on that. And uh, yes, ev everything about... The rituals of Islam has either a shade of polytheism in it or was adapted from a polytheistic culture and then it was Islamicized, if you wish. AP, you want to add to this? Uh, same. I mean, there, there are many aspects of Islam that are based on uh, pre-Islamic uh, polytheism. I'm actually working on a video uh, where I want to talk about all the uh, pagan aspects of Islam. I'm not sure when I'm going to publish that, probably within the few next few days. But there, there are a lot. I mean, the Kaaba, the Black Stone, the the, the, the Hajj ritual, just too many things. Yeah. Well, we have at least a couple of minutes left, folks. Um, uh, anything else you want to add, uh, David? Uh, I would just agree. Really, really pagan. Yeah. I mean, and anytime, I mean, you're, you're touching a stone or kissing a stone or bound to a stone, it doesn't take a rocket uh, scientist to figure that out. I mean, it, it is a stone and, and you are worshiping a stone. Even if you tell me it represents a deity, that mm. mean, your worship is going through the stone and somehow making its way to the deity. And uh, yeah, uh, matter of fact, uh, everyone be sure to subscribe to uh, Al Fadi's channel because we just made videos discussing some of this. And, right. uh, an example is the story of the satanic verses, where uh, the Allah, Alusa, and Manat were these like bird goddesses who would carry your prayers to Allah. And then, of course, every Muslim would recognize that as, as a bunch of pagan nonsense. But then, Muhammad tells his followers that chapters of the Quran are going to appear and intercede for Muslims as flocks of birds. So notice, it is, it is completely a, a replacement paganism, right? It's, hey, you guys like the ideas of these birdies carrying your prayers to Allah and interceding for you, um, but yeah, it can't be other goddesses, we'll just make it the Quran. So now chapters of the Quran are taking the function of Allah, Alusa, and Manat, but you ask you, you ask Muslims, hey, uh, was it paganism when it was a lot Alusa and Manat interceding for you as these as these birds? Yes, that was paganism. Okay, when it's Surat Al Fatiha and Surat, uh, you know, I mean, when it's Surat Al Imran and Surat Al Baqarah uh, becoming, you know, being these birds who are interceding for you, is that flocks paganism? Flocks of birds. Is that, yeah, flocks of birds yeah. interceding for you. Is that paganism? No, it's pure Islamic monotheism. Just pure Islamic monotheism. You, you can. In Islam, you could just take anything, any pagan practice in the history of humanity and just say, uh, we're now saying it's pure monotheism and it'll suddenly become pure monotheism. I mean, the, the black stone will testify on the day of judgment. You greet it when you go to uh, to Mecca. You you love it. You kiss it. And on the day of judgment, it will rise and will testify and say, hey, this guy, uh, you know, greeted me. So, uh, well, I hope the darn thing will remember how many times I kissed it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. With that, I also want to say uh, subscribe to uh, the channel, to Al Fadi's channel, to Sierra International. Appreciate you might you not be interested in uh, David Wood's videos, I understand, but I also do some work on this channel and we have made some uh, videos together and we'll do more in the future. So, yep. I mean, I look forward to having you again, AP. Uh, we'll be in touch and, and David uh, also. And, um, and hopefully we'll do even more videos here, AP. Uh, we've been talking about this. So I want to thank everyone here for joining us today in this live stream and uh, thankful uh, for uh, all of your comments. Sorry if we can get uh, to some of them. And thank you to our moderators for both channels. Thank you, AP. Thank you, David. And again, when are you guys going live tomorrow? Have you decided what time for people? Yeah, it's to... already set up on his channel. 
Okay. Yeah, I didn't ask David. I just set it up. He'll just have to comply with that. All right. So you guys, uh, it's going to be on your channel, AP? Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, tomorrow they'll be live uh, talking about this stabbing uh, that uh, happened. And, and, and they, they should take their time because you want to investigate something like this and not just rush into making statements that will come back later and be used against you. But again, if indeed the stabbing has to do with uh, difference in views, yeah, that's wrong. Absolutely, that's wrong. I mean, we, we don't want to condone anybody's, uh, you know, being hurt or harmed or stabbed or whatever the case might be. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi over and out. God bless you. Take care. And stay away from it.